in the lifetime of The Simpsons when they were a very good show. Um, I stopped watching about 10 years ago, so they're still making them. Uh, so the idea was, and you can tell me culinarily if this is true or not, that there is a type of blowfish that if you cut it just right is the most delicious delicacy ever, and if you cut it wrong, it's poisonous and will kill you. Is that true? Or, that's true? You think that's true? You probably saw it on The Simpsons, though. <laughs> No? Okay. There, we have a non-Simpsons watcher who says, yes, this is a thing. There is a type of fish that if you cut it wrong, you will die. Uh, and so in the episode, Homer orders it. The, the poor guy's a rookie, and he's looking at the book, and they don't know. And Homer goes the whole episode thinking he's about to die. Um, and it is actually one of the more biblical episodes, because at the end, he, he can't sleep, obviously, that night. And so he puts on a, a, a cassette tape Walkman. You even know what that is? <laughs> we have a deacon who doesn't know what a cassette tape Walkman is. What board are you serving on? No technology. <laughs> Probably a good fit. So, he puts on a Walkman with the Bible on cassette. So that, that's an interesting way to, to end the episode. And he, of course, wakes up the next morning. He's not dead. He's alive. And probably forgets that he was listening to the Bible. It's Homer Simpson. Uh, but anyway. Uh, the doctrinal equivalent of eating blowfish is my way of saying if you present this teaching wrong, or if it's taught wrong, it can grieve consciences almost to the point of despairing of God and death. Um, but if it is taught the way the Bible presents it, it is just one of the most comforting and reassuring doctrines there is. Yes? Okay, Mr. Oakland. Volunteers need to get this one's for so if you could hear that, we need coffee and donut hosts to volunteer. It's a simple pickup, drop off, which I think you can do on Saturday, right? Yep, you can pick them up. It's the Maple Grove uh, Target. Uh, go back to the bakery, ask for donuts. You get two big boxes, you only pay scan one, it's like about twenty-five, twenty-six dollars. We reimburse you for the collection stuff. So you up on Saturday, we're here in the morning. So not too tough, you don't have to make the order or guess what people want. It's all prepared. It's it's literally a pickup and drop off and then serve on Sunday morning. So if you can do that, please do help out. Uh, so that we can all be well, well fed on sugary goodness. <laughs> if you don't, we're serving blowfish. <laughs> all right. So, what is this doctrine, this biblical teaching, that could really grieve and terrify consciences if it's taught wrong, and would really comfort consciences if it's taught the way the Bible presents it? The doctrine of election. How did that get in there? <laughs> this is not about your kind of election, Mr. President. I know, I'm very sad to hear that it's not about him today. So, the doctrine of election can be a deadly poison for us if it's taught this way. Uh, if it's taught wrongly, it raises questions like, is God the cause of evil and sin? That's a terrifying question to think if the answer is yes. If we're teaching the doctrine of election, and what scripture says about predestination, in such a way that God is the cause of evil and sin, that is terrifying to think about. If the doctrine of election is taught wrongly, if it's not explained properly the way scripture puts it and limits or stops where scripture doesn't speak, it can raise the question, is it God's will to damn people? And if the answer is yes, if we're teaching the doctrine of election so that the answer to this question is yes, that is terrifying. If the doctrine of election is taught that he elects, chooses, predestines those who are saved, and therefore we must also conclude that he also chooses, elects, or predestines who will be damned, if we are teaching it in such a way that that question is answered with a yes, that will terrify consciences. 
and also go beyond what Scripture teaches. Uh, because ultimately all three of these wind up with the great problem of how would any of us, how would you yourself know which camp you're in? If we teach the doctrine of election in such a way that God is the cause of evil and sin, how do you know that he doesn't cause it in you? And that he does not have the will, the desire, the intent to condemn you. And that he has already chosen from eternity to damn you. If these are taught in the wrong way, we have no assurance, no certainty of what God's demeanor towards us is. So that is why this can be a very deadly and poisonous teaching if taught wrong. If it goes beyond what Scripture says about it. If it uses logical deductions instead of sticking with the plain words of Scripture. On the flip side, if it is taught properly, it can be one of the most comforting teachings uh, that Scripture has for souls that are troubled. For those who are worried that despite their... their uh, their baptism and their faith, that their continuous falling into sin is somehow proof that God is actually eternally against them, working for their demise. That doubt can be greatly removed and comforted by the proper teaching of election, which requires us to listen to God's word, to approach election through the gospel, because what we're going to see in the scripture passages that talk about predestination is they are all speaking uh, in words of law or gospel, they are speaking in gospel. They are speaking in reference to Christ's work of salvation and God's love for us. So is that law or gospel? That is gospel. And we are talking about God's love for us, God's work of salvation for us. That is gospel language, and that is where the doctrine of election is taught, it is not taught in reference to the law. As we've seen many times already in this topical series, we avoid logical deductions. That means we avoid adding philosophy to try and fill in what we think are gaps in the scriptural text. If we think scripture doesn't answer one of our questions, our natural human uh, desire is to fill in the gap. Sometimes you can do that without really creating much damage or problems, but in this case, that gap, that paradox, would be filled in with something that terrifies consciences and robs us of our certainty and comfort in Christ. So we do not want to apply that kind of deductive work in this article. And as I said, do not approach the election through the doctrine of the law, what we must do, or what we must avoid doing. <coughs> even as looking at that as proof of election can greatly terrify our consciences. So as I've already alluded to, be ready to accept paradoxes. What is a paradox? A paradox is uh, two things, maybe even more than two things, that appear to be irreconcilable or inconsistent, and yet both are true. So two things or more that are true, but appear to be illogical, irreconcilable, inconsistent. Uh, and this does happen often with Scripture. We've seen this a couple times already uh, when we had our week on the Lord's Supper and the two natures of Christ. How can a real human body be in more than one place at once, let alone on multiple altars all around the world? It appears to be impossible, inconsistent, illogical, and yet this is what God's Word teaches. In the case of election, part of the paradox comes in in that we are talking about God, who as an attribute is transcendent. He is not bound by time. Whereas you and I live on a timeline. There was a time when we were not. When even Adam and Eve were not. When the world was not. Time began on the first day. And then our mode of tracking time is created on the fourth day, right? Uh, so sometimes when our, third, when our third and fourth graders get a chance to ask me questions, they'll ask about eternity or heaven. And, you know, it's above even our ability to understand and explain. So how do you talk about it with a child? 
Uh, once they get to the point where they've studied a little bit about time and astronomy, you can remind them, okay, how do we, here on planet Earth, mark time? It's not the, the arch titan Kronos, who's more powerful than the gods, although we treat him like that. What is time? I'll start you out more simply. What time is it? Everybody look. What time is it? 9.40. A.M. or P.M.? A.M. Anti-meridian. P.M. Post-meridian. What are these terms referring to? The Earth's position relative to its rotation on its axis, right, which is on a daily cycle. Right? That's what time is, a 24-hour marking of our Earth's rotation on its axis. Um, that is what a day is, and we break it up in minutes and hours and seconds. Um, and what is a year? What is that mark of time? Our revolution around the sun, right? 365.25 days. You could also have a calendar, just to show you that time is relative. Uh, you could also have a calendar that's lunar like the, the Jewish calendar in the Old Testament, where instead of having a leap, a leap day added in every four years, you have a leap month added every seven years. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. So, time itself is something God creates and oversees, because the heavens, the stars, the sun, the moon, they are all things He has created. He can make them stand still, as He did once for Joshua and the Israelites in battle. So, man lives on a timeline, and we have such a hard time understanding anything off this timeline, let alone God in eternity. And part of this discussion of election is going to be that Scripture speaks about both. Scripture speaks about God's activity here in time. I was baptized October 19th, 1986. Right? God acted in time. Something happened in time. Uh, and yet God is also eternal and in eternity transcendent from this life. This is part of where the paradox is going to come from. We're not going to solve the paradox today. We'll never solve paradoxes. They, they wouldn't be paradoxes if we could solve them. We have to be ready to accept them. Meaning when Scripture speaks in two ways or two words that appear irreconcilable, we hold both true. That's the Lutheran way of doing theology. The Lutheran way of doing the, all theology, so especially this doctrine of election, but the Lutheran way of doing any theology places a higher priority on scripturalness than on an apparent consistency. And I added there the word logical consistency. Um, that's a quote from uh, Robert Preuss, your father-in-law. Uh, places a higher priority on scripturalness than on apparent consistency. We can, when we try to, or when churches and theologians try to make scripture appear consistent, they will often cut off their nose to spite their face. They will cut off the gospel in order to have a more logically consistent paradigm, system, whatever. Uh, we cannot do that. We do not want to do that. So we will allow scripture to be scripture, divine revelation to be divine revelation, even if at times it appears inconsistent. That is vital to the Lutheran way of doing theology. So, if this all comes down to Scripture, what does Scripture say on the doctrine of election? The two most important verses that I want us to look at, I've got on here, Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now Paul speaks often very inductively. It's a sad thing that our education system has lost the language of deductive and inductive logic and reasoning because you build arguments, you build statements like that. So Paul puts, ultimately this is, verse 28 is the conclusion, but it comes first and then he provides the rationale, the build up for it. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. How do we know this? Now we get the explanation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What image did his son bear? A crucified one. Remember, that if you think about the larger context of Romans 8, this is explaining 
how it is working together for good when Christians are suffering even looking crucified like Christ. So, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the crucified image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he called. Same word. And those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now some of those actions, like the calling by the gospel, the justifying of the sinner, are things that happen in time. And yet this foreknowing and predestining is something that happens in eternity. And that's where a lot of those questions are going to be raised that we saw earlier. How can this both happen? How can this all be true? Any questions on Romans 8 before we move to Ephesians 1, the next clear passage on election? Right, so God predestines, and those whom he predestines, he calls, justifies, glorifies. The glorification is what we are still awaiting when Christ returns, and we shall be like him. All right, Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as... He chose us in Him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. All right, so we are predestined to be adopted as his sons, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So before there was ever a creation, before there was ever time itself, sun, moon, stars to mark the seasons, the days, the years, before that ever happened, he chose us in Christ, predestining us to be adopted as sons through Christ. All of this in and through Christ, that's gospel language. So back to the Romans where it said foreknew. Yes. What does that mean, he foreknew? You and your daughter love asking questions about <laughs> two slides ahead of me. So great. <laughs> I foreknew you would ask that. <laughs> I have a definition for foreknowledge. Very good. All right, before we get to that defining a foreknowledge, the heart of this issue, the reason why we talk about election God foreknowing, predestining, calling, justifying, is that it gets to the heart of an issue that we had earlier on. So actually this week there won't actually be a historical controversy because at the point the Formula of Concord was written there was no question about election. There wasn't a controversy about it. There came about one a couple hundred years later. It's one of the things that separates uh, American Lutherans in the early days. Uh, but they did see that if you do misunderstand original sin, free will, and conversion, the first two topics we studied, it will invariably bleed into this doctrine as well, because what is the cause of salvation? I'll start by asking, who is the sole causer of salvation? God. God alone causes man to be saved. This is what we sometimes call monergism. One cause, one person doing the work accomplishes salvation, and that is God, and it must remain God. If we start taking some of the cause away, saying he's 90% of the cause of salvation, I'm 10% of it, uh, we have now robbed our fellow Christians of the certainty of salvation. We've also diminished Christ as Savior. He's now only a 90% Savior, not a full 100% Savior. So... As we saw way back when we started this, there are two biblical causes of salvation here in time. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Holy Spirit, using the Word of God, effects what we call conversion, the changing from unbeliever to believer, the bringing about of salvation. That is what the Holy Spirit and the Word of God does in time. That's that two-part ca two cause of salvation is election at work. Election is something that happens in eternity. And where does that happen in my life, in your life, here in time? When the Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel. 
Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith, right? So this is the sole cause of salvation in time, and the way we speak of it in eternity is election. God chose us before the foundation of the world to send his Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, to bring about repentance and faith in me, in you. Earlier on, when we were only dealing with uh, the doctrine of free will or conversion, Philip Melanchthon tried to introduce a third cause, man's assenting will, that when the Holy Spirit calls us by the gospel, man must, there's your law word, man must assent, agree, give in. That's a logical deduction, that's not how scripture speaks of the causes of salvation. And ultimately, like we saw, that introduces doubt. Was my decision sincere? Was it well informed? Is it valid because I've sinned after I heard the gospel and received it? So it creates great doubt where there ought to be certainty in the heart of a Christian. And it also reduces Christ's role from full Savior. The full content that the Holy Spirit preaches is Christ crucified. And now it focuses on the work man must do. The reason this was included in the 16th century in the formula of Concord was they saw if you get this wrong, you're also going to get wrong election. God's eternal choosing us. Because that is solely God's work and it shows that it is God's work. We weren't even created yet when he chose us, when he loved us, saved us, and called us to be his. All right, so that, this is something that if we introduce a third cause that has to do with man's work, we have just taken from God... Uh, his soul work, and we've taken from our Christians the certainty that it's done. What they're trying to do in both the, the question about uh, free will and conversion, or later on when they do stumble, when Lutherans do stumble on this doctrine of election, what they're trying to do is answer an unanswerable problem. Say that five times fast. <laughs> answer an unanswerable problem. That. Yeah. More coffee first. <laughs> Because this is ultimately the paradox. The unanswerable problem or question is, why do some, to whom the gospel comes, respond in faith, and why do others reject it in unbelief? That's the question that they wanted to answer under free will and conversion. That's what they'll later want to answer when, they, when the American Lutherans start tinkering with the doctrine of election. They're trying to, uh, to answer an unanswerable problem. If, if, the Holy, if, the, if the cause of salvation is solely God, the Holy Spirit calling by the gospel and even creating or working that uh, repentance and faith in us, if it's solely his work, then why is it resisted? How can you resist irresistible grace? Right? It seems counterintuitive, illogical, but that is an apparent inconsistency. That's what we call a paradox. Now the problem here is the, the tactic we normally want to take to address this unanswerable problem is option A. We're trying to let God off the hook. Ultimately, he doesn't need our help defending him, but that's what these explanations, whether it's making man's assenting will a third cause of salvation, or changing the doctrine of election around so that he chooses us only by looking, he looks into the future and sees, well, would this person of their own free will choose me? Okay, then I'll choose him. Uh, either way, you're trying to let God off the hook and make it all about man's will or works. Now, the simple answer from Romans 9 will be, uh, rather bluntly, God doesn't need your help defending him. Who are you to be questioning him in the first place? That's not the same thing as saying, you know, God predestines them to damnation. That's what some will then take Romans 9 a little too far. No, Romans 9 just kind of puts it out there in the same language at the end of Job, when Job has been suffering under the hands of the devil, not God. Uh, and God says, who are you to question? All right, he keeps it hidden. He keeps his will and his counsels hidden sometimes. And all he asks is, what, who do you think you are to question? So God doesn't need our help letting him off the hook or defending him from what appears to us 
to be a difficult teaching or a logical inconsistency or, God forbid, in the worst case scenario, God being a cruel tyrant who just arbitrarily <laughs> decides who he wants to damn before he even created them. Now that's a terrifying thought. In the same way, by doing this, it robs the Christian and the gospel of its certainty because it no longer leaves it with God as the sole worker of salvation, but it makes it about what we can do. And then it also would rob God of his exclusive work. God is the sole cause of salvation. So what is option B then? If option A ends up leaving us doubtful and terrified and taking from God the work that is only his, what's the other option? Flip over my notes. It's on the back side. <laughs> option B. Let Scripture be the divine revelation that it is, and beware of probing beyond that. That was Luther's advice always. Uh, that's what our confessions advise, and what every good pastor should advise his people to do, even sometimes the, the kids when they're asking, is Scripture hasn't told us. God's Word hasn't revealed this part. And we are careful to probe too deeply into the mysteries of uh, God and his triune nature, his eternal wisdom, and be humble and accept the fact that what he has revealed is still more than we could ever be uh, content with. Right? We'll never outgrow uh, the Christ in the manger, as Luther put it once. He, there he wasn't talking about election, he was talking about the triune nature, the mystery of the Trinity. And he says, rather than probing deeply into the mechanics of how one God can be three persons and yet still one God, rather than probe into the mechanics of that, kneel humbly at the manger of Christ. What, Christ, what God has revealed in Christ Jesus. You'll never outgrow that. You'll never be uh, fully satiated and need more than that. So don't probe too deeply. The problem is natural man always wants to probe too deeply and get out over his skis. So, if we let Scripture be Scripture, and not probe beyond it, then what does Scripture allow us to say about election, and where must we stop investigating it? <clears throat> so, now we get our definitions. Foreknowledge. God knows all things before they happen. Knowledge before. That's what foreknowledge means. So, we see that in Daniel 2.28, when Daniel speaks to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and says, God who knows all things has revealed to you in advance the things that are going to happen in the latter days. So God knows in advance everything that's going to happen in complete detail. So Scripture does allow us to speak of foreknowledge in that way. God knows from eternity everything that's going to happen in its full detail. What we should not say based on that would be to logically conclude that God is the cause of evil. Here's how it works, and you'll hear how it is logically consistent. It's a paradox, though, because it disagrees with Scripture. So the logical conclusion would be, uh, if God knows beforehand that it will happen, whether it's sin or unbelief or the, even the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, if he knows beforehand, through foreknowledge, that it will happen, doesn't that logically necessitate that it will happen? This will, you can hear how this is a philosophical argument. You don't have biblical passages that speak this way. The philosophical argument is, God's foreknowledge, the fact that God knows something in advance, means that it has to happen and could not happen any other way, because if it did, God would be wrong. And God can't be wrong. So you see how log apparently that seems more logically consistent. It seems logically consistent to say, if God does foreknow everything that happens in advance, which he does, then everything that happens is, by nature, the way it has to be, caused by, even caused by God. That his knowing it in advance from eternity causes it to happen, requires that it be that way and no other. It holds logically, and that's why some Christian churches venture into this, uh, this very frightening, in my opinion, teaching uh, of what's called determinism or fatalism. In which case, you just end up throwing up your hands and doing whatever because it couldn't be any different anyway. Um, so it holds logically, but that's not how Scripture speaks. Scripture speaks the exact opposite. God is not the cause of evil. But how can that be if he foreknows everything in advance and couldn't be any other way? How is he not the cause of evil? Because that's what Scripture does say. Bear with me. We've got a couple more paradoxes. 
So the next definition, predestination and election, that God chooses from eternity his godly beloved children. We've already looked at the passages that put that forward, Romans 8, Ephesians 1. So God chooses from eternity his godly beloved children. Now his, this choosing, electing, predestining is the cause of their salvation. Scripture will give us that much. Remember, our main question, if we go back to the last slide, what does Scripture allow us to say and where do we have to stop? So with foreknowledge, it allows us to say that God knows everything before it happens. It makes us stop before our human conclusion that He must cause evil. For predestination, it tells us God chooses us in eternity, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. And this is the cause of our salvation. The reason the Holy Spirit's work on us works is God chose us. But it tells us to stop there before logical conclusions or deductions or searching into why God thinks the way He does or chooses the way He does. We can only search it out in divinely revealed Scripture. Now, some great, one great quote from the, the Confessions. God's Word leads us to Christ, who is the book of life, in whom all are written and elected who are to be saved in eternity. For it is written in Ephesians 1, 4, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So, He chose us before the foundation of the world and here in time. God's Word itself is the thing that leads us to know that. God's Word itself teaches us and reveals to us that He has chosen us from eternity. So how it works, if I could put it in uh, kind of crass terms, God loves, saves, elects from eternity, before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1. Uh, then the Son becomes incarnate, dies and rises, that's in history, right? The Holy Spirit calls all Christians by the gospel, enlightens us with his gifts, sanctifies, and keeps us in the one true faith. So, the cause of this, the cause of the Holy Spirit calling me by the gospel is because I am chosen or elect. I do not resist to receive this word and the Spirit himself.